Glenn Lowry here. This is the Glenn Show. We're the black guys at Blogging Hands Talk TV. We are underway. John, how are you doing? I'm good, Glenn. How are you? I'm good, all things considered. This is Glenn Lowry. This is the Glenn Show. At uh, Where are we? We're at Substack. GlennLowry.substack.com. John has a Substack, too. He doesn't want you to forget that. I so don't. For these Glenn and shows. also, Glenn, may I please yeah. um, interject? Not only is my newsletter at Substack now, but Lexicon Valley, my podcast, has moved officially now from Slate to Substack under the umbrella studio of BooksmartStudios.org. And so those of you who have liked Lexicon Valley or who would like to sample it, please come to Substack because now I will be represented on Substack in three ways. One, my newsletter. Two, my talks with Glenn. And three, Lexicon Valley, same title, is now at Substack. I will be recording the first Substack episode after I finish with Glenn today, and it will drop Tuesday after next. So John, get ready. John McWhorter. I almost want to say John fucking McWhorter. <laughs> <laughs> you remember that scene from Jerry Maguire? You ever see that movie? Jerry That's like McGuire. the one movie I haven't seen. I, uh, I hate to admit it. Tom Cruise vehicle. It's actually not half bad. Uh, you know. Cuba Gooding and you know, show me yeah, the money. Oh, Cuba Gooding Jr. is amazing. In this Renee film. Zellweger broke out. I just never got around to seeing it. Yeah. Show me the money. That's the signature quote from that movie. Show me the money. That's a line that Cuba <laughs> Gooding, who's a star, a wide receiver, a National Football League uh, uh, athlete, and Tom Cruise is his agent. Uh, <laughs> anyway, anyway, John McWhorter at Substack. Go ahead and do it, John. And the Lexicon Valley thing. I mean, I don't even know if I could do this, John. You just sit there in front of the you're not even talking to anybody. You're lecturing to the microphone for 45 minutes or whatever it is. Uh, well, you about can see language. You picture. Yeah, it's it's your teacher. You're, you're not looking down at notes or anything. Man. How do no, you no, it? no. How do you do it? I mean, it's almost like it's extemporaneous. Well, I have like an index card of notes, like what am I, what's the order of the topics and things like that. But you're talking to this imaginary audience. I'm basically a classroom. Yeah, you just do it. And at least that's all I do. It's this fun. is the sign of a master of his craft, if I may say. So I'm talking about John Hamilton McWhorter, mm -hmm. the fourth. Fifth. The fifth, John Hamilton McWhorter, this is a sign of a master of his craft. So much wisdom, so much accumulated knowledge that he can simply hold forth about language almost extemporaneously for the better part of an hour. And you do it every other week, do you? Every other week. And you know what I'm going to do today, actually? Spelling bee. Because did you see? I did see. Black girl yeah. on the spelling bee. And to give something away, do you know that the first... This is what I wanted to share because I can tell this isn't going to get around. First national spelling bee back in the 20s was won by a black girl. People don't talk about that. Oh, I didn't. There know was no that. such thing as a South Asian immigrant here then for the most part. And you assume it would be some white boy named Edward. It was a black girl. So people should know things are coming full circle. I think the spelling bee phenomenon has been studied. I think there have been some very good documentary films about how all the uh, the Indian American participants have, uh, you know, mastered this thing. And I guess there's this, you know, uh, incredible kind of practice and study regimen that you have to go through hours a day with lists of words, thousands of words every day that you're scanning and committing the memory somehow. I have no idea how these kids do it, but it's, it's very a weird impressive. thing. Yeah, it's a weird yeah weird endeavor but yeah next lexicon valley is about the spelling bee so that's my ad for lexicon valley now another thing that i find interesting about this john because we're the black guys at bloggingheads.tv and the black guys at substack.com they must have other black guys at substack but we're the black guys you know that's mm -hmm. our brand is that this mastery that you're exhibiting and sharing with the world uh really kind of doesn't have all that much to do with race does it no Lexicon Valley is not about my feelings. It's not about ambiguity. It's not about identity. It's not about race. It's often about me, but it's about me watching Bugs Bunny and not the minstrel ones. It's about just a human being who likes language. And I, I don't say this on the show, but part of the reason that I don't make it about race is because I think of it as a statement. I mean, 95% of it is, is the, that I am sharing my toys, but 5% is to show that 
a black person may do a podcast about being black and some should, but it is possible for a black person to do a podcast just about stuff. And that is what Lexicon Valley is about. And that's what it'll always be about. Very important, I think. So you don't consider yourself to be uh, when I was in graduate school, they said they used to ask, are you a black economist or are you an economist who happens to be black? (laughs) So are you a black linguist or are you just a just a, a linguist who happens to be black? I'm a black linguist for the general public where I need to be. I consider that a responsibility. And I always have like there's a reason that I um. well, no, that's wrong. Because that is often called upon, and there are only so many of us, I do that as a duty. That's important. In my academic linguistics work, I am a linguist who happens to be Black. I am one of the world's specialists on Creole languages, and that's not because anybody in my family came from Jamaica or something like that. I chose Creoles partly because I wanted even my academic work to have something to do with the diaspora and Blackness. But I also very deliberately did not become one of the black linguists who does black English. I can fake it. I can do my job. But and and academically, I've done a little on black English, but I very deliberately in the beginning thought I'm not going to do this studying the way my grandmother talks. I want to study something far outside of myself. But the Creoles are a way of having one foot in. But I'm as interested in talking about Chinese and Persian as I am in how the verb to be works in black English. So, yeah, in between, you know, I know who I am and I feel like there's certain duties, but I didn't get into linguistics to study blackness. I got into linguistics because I like teaching myself Spanish, basically. Are you a black economist? Uh, Well, if you ask the black economists, they're going to say no, because when the American Economics Association in the uh, year of racial awakening put out a reading list that all seeking wokeness in the economics fraternity should consult. They somehow managed to get Ibram X. Kendi and Robin DiAngelo's books on the list, but they somehow managed not to get the anatomy of racial inequality, Harvard University Press 2002, to be reissued in a 20th anniversary paperback edition this summer on the list, the American Economics Association advised by a committee of black economists about how to handle the race question created a reading list in economics that omits my 2002 Harvard University Press landmark and pathbreaking, if I can say so, uh, uh, book called The Anatomy of Racial Inequality. Okay, and here's the kicker. The kicker is the guy who wrote that book was to the left of a lot of people on that committee. That, that book, excuse me for saying so, but since you went on about your own work for a while, John, I think I can do this, is a more coherent and rigorous and incisive statement of a theory of systemic racism than anything you're likely to find in the, what, the pablum that passes for uh, advocacy scholarship on these questions today. That's my book, not on the list. Economists seeking guidance about what to read about race from the American Economics Association were not directed to my work. Not only that, Roland Fryer's work is not on that list. None of Roland Fryer's papers, he doesn't have a big book out yet, are on the list of the committee advising the American Economics Association about what to read on race. So, no, I'm not a black economist as far as the professional blacks who happen to be economists. No, note the subtle These distinction people, that we're making here. They're not this, just blacks who happen to be economists. They're not just blacks who happen to be economists. They're professional blacks. That's all they do is be black. And they happen to be economists. Don't see fit to advise the uh, uh, untutored on race questions in the economics profession about the existence of Glenn Lowry. Thomas Sowell is not on the list. The American Economics Association does not advise its members who seek guidance on what to know about the economics of racial inequality to read Thomas Sowell. They're all so sure of themselves, too. All these people have book lined offices. All of these people have very high IQs. They're not crazy. Oh, but as a body, they consider this okay. Not you, not Sowell, 
not Roland. Whereas even if Roland hasn't been a big book person, you know, the, the articles are so magisterial, oh, that you can be quite sure if he were coming from the hard left and or saying the things they like, they would link to his articles, especially today when all you have to do is go to a link to find an article. They would make an exception. They're so sure of themselves, and there's so many of them. It's why every now and then I think, are they right? And then I, re I realize that no, just because there are a lot of them doesn't mean they're right. I'm sorry no. about that. Yeah. Well, no, it's okay. I'm, I'm good. You know, <laughs> I mean, believe me, I'm okay. <laughs> and as we've discussed, I could trade you a couple of stories like that in terms of linguistics with the equivalence of the same people. And yeah, they are so sure of themselves, but we go on basically. And, you know, I, I think we both feel pretty good about what we're doing, but yeah, you do get those snubs. It is. Yeah. Something. It, it, it's yeah, it's, it is what it is. I mean, my PhD dissertation, 1976, man, that's a half century ago, damn near. Uh, was about race and racial inequality, a dynamic theory of racial inequality. The article has 2,500 citations in uh, Google Scholar. It's had a tremendous impact. It's still being cited to this day. But I'm not a black economist. You know, you know so, what gets me? And here's where we're <laughs> going to be accused of being petty, but I'm just going to get this out there, as I say, in case I get hit by a bus, because it's something that always just, it leaves me just in awe of the plasticity of human nature and behavior. The people who leave you off of lists like that and don't ask you to do this and that, you know, you, you read a whole survey of something that you've had important things to say about and you're not cited at all and people nobody's ever heard of are, all of that. The people responsible for that, I'm sure you've experienced this. You're at a conference, you know, the usual hotel ballrooms and stuff, and they treat you so nicely. You know, often the very people who are responsible for this will come a few, you know, a few chairs down the bar and say hello to you. And I sit there, I'll shake that person's hand. I'm looking into their eyes and I'm thinking, I know what you did and I know what you think of me. And yet you have to sit there and make these pleasantries. And I think it's the same person. Isn't human, and I don't mean duplicity, I mean plasticity, what people can, the way people can chew gum and walk at the same time. Somebody who I know was responsible for exactly that sort of snub. Oh, hi, John. And it's not just because they saw me on TV and they think of me as a little bit glamorous because I have a public presence because they were doing this before I had any of that. They don't. It's a lot of them, I think, don't fully realize that they did anything that would be questionable at all or something. But have you noticed that that all those people will be very nice to you in person, but you, you don't get to be on these very basic lists. Yeah, you're making an interesting point, uh, an interesting point. But let's move on. That's, you know, it's enough of this crying in our beer. And I'm not really crying because I'm fine. I'm, I'm OK. Uh, the, I don't and, even and, have a beer. And interestingly, the uh, uh, the wider economics profession, uh, since we're talking about this, has heaped all kinds of honors on me. I've been elected vice president of the American Economics Association. I've been appointed a distinguished fellow of the American Economics Association. No more than four scholars in a year can be named by the uh, by the um, statute, by the uh, organization's legislation can be uh, bestowed the honor of distinguished fellow. So there are only a couple of hundred of us living uh, on the planet right now who are distinguished fellows of the American Economics Association. So, you know. Um, but enough, enough. What are we talking about, John? We're always talking about this race stuff. And, there's, and this race stuff seems never to go away. I pick up my newspaper this morning and I find that Al Sharpton and Benjamin Crump are attending in BB, B-E-E-B-E, -E -E, or B-Bay, or Biba. I don't know how they say it, Arkansas, small town in Arkansas. The memorial service for one Hunter Britain, B-R-I-T-T-A-I-N, I hope I pronounce his name correctly, unfortunately now deceased, killed by an Arkansas police officer who stopped him at 3 a.m. a few weeks ago and shot him dead and did not turn on his body camera. So there's no video of the killing. A white guy, a white guy, a Hunter Britain, a white guy killed by an Arkansas police officer. And the family invited Al Sharpton and Benjamin Crump, that's Al Sharpton of Al Sharpton fame, and Benjamin Crump of witness fraud in the Trayvon Martin George Zimmerman case fame, uh, 
That's his epithet. <laughs> <laughs> Do the memorial service at a high school in Bee Bay, Arkansas. And they went. They went. And are now quoted in the newspaper. This is CNN. They're quoted as saying, uh, I think it's Crump who was literally quoted, but as Sharpton is also quoted as saying that there are white victims of police violence as well. And that if they were, that is Crump and Sharpton and others, to take up the cause of such victims, they might increase the likelihood that the George Floyd uh, uh, Justice and Policing Act would get passed the Congress and get signed into law by President Biden, and they could further their cause. And uh, I read that and I, I said, duh, I've been saying that for like five years or something. I mean, there are way more whites than black, twice as many at least, who are killed by police officers in any given year. I've been saying it's not a racial thing. It's a thing about policing and citizens and you know, accountability and 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 the maintenance of order and uh, and so on like that. I've been saying that for a long time, but it looks like Brother Al and Brother Ben are waking up to that reality. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. That one is a beautiful indication of how complex social history actually is, as opposed to the way many people seem to think. Because, you know, talk about the, um, what's that expression, circle of empathy that, you can only have empathy for, you know, it's easier to have empathy for people of your own kind. And then this, the signal. All the concentric circles and you go further yeah. and further out. You, yeah. You're less and less attached to the people the further they are. Away yeah. from you. I would say that it is more likely that there could be meaningful legislation about what the cops do to people if it were not seen as something that happens only to young black men who, you know, as often as not are in some kind of trouble. Not always, you know, Philando Castile is one kind, but then, you know, as often as not, something was up and it went wrong. If it was shown that this was a white as well as a black thing, then I think more people would be more moved to do something. And next thing you knew, you would have something that is seen as a black problem vastly le lim vastly lessened you know close to eliminated hopefully and a lot of people would then walk away thinking that something had been done about a black problem and even if they didn't that black problem wouldn't exist and after exactly one generation of black men not seeing the cops as their enemy we could move on from a great many things but it's interesting when you think about the statements from Sharpton slash Crump, for them, this is just cynicism. They figure call attention to this happening to a white boy or two or three, and people, most Americans will be more moved. But I'm imagining that in Crump's mind, I don't know what's going on in Sharpton's mind, but Crump's mind, the idea is still that this is something that happens mainly to Black people. There are these exceptions, these white exceptions. Let's call some attention to these white exceptions, because if we hold them up and make some noise, that'll make racist white people interested. But I doubt if either one of them understand that, one, it happens to more white people, and two, that that very simple fact is not negated by the fact that it happens to a disproportionate amount of black men because poverty also makes you more likely to come in contact with the cops. And the disproportion with black people is 2.5 and black people are 2.5 as more likely to be poor. That's a very simple statistical correlation. And so I know it's not about race. You taught me that. And I know that still, if you say that now, if you say, you know what, it's not about race, the numbers make it clear. And that means that, you know, you know, wait for it, folks, George Floyd did not die because of his color. And you can see people just shuffling and not wanting to process it. And then you say Tony Tempo was white, and he died the same way. And you talk about the nature of humanity and cognitive dissonance. I've noticed that for many people, you say Tony Tempo, and you know, that can't be gainsaid. There's nothing you can say. And they just shut down. There's just nothing to be done. I don't mean they're mean, but the subject has to change. They don't have anything to say. They just can't go further than that. I'm sure that that's what Sharpton and Crump are like. They're just not going to hear that this is not a racial problem. But, you know, maybe if they do call attention to more people like this white kid, maybe that will get more things to happen. And what you and I think about how it went versus what Benjamin Crump thinks, nobody will care about that in 50 years. But let's, let's try this. And you know something, Glenn? Just maybe. Just maybe us talking about this 
and some other people who followed us, maybe it made a difference. You know, just imagine they're actually calling attention to the thing that happens much, much more than it happens to black men, Shapton and Crump. They're doing it cynically, but I wonder if there's been a meme that's gotten out there that white people get killed too. And I'm not trying to flatter us. I'm, my, my inclination is to think no. But yeah, this is, a, this is a good thing for many reasons, however different people are going to interpret it. But yeah. Well, yeah. I, I'd say, look, um, give them credit for doing the right thing, whatever the reasons. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing I'd say. It's a, a positive development. Mm -hmm. So hats off to Benjamin Crump. Hats off to Al Sharpton for taking up the cause of a white victim of police violence and for understanding that doing so is probably a positive step of, to trying to achieve the goals that they want to achieve, whatever the reasons might be. I, I am inclined not to extend the benefit of the doubt about the cynicism. I'm inclined to think, yeah, they put their calculator on and they've done a calculation and they figured out that you know, this is the optimal way of playing their hand. And so they're playing their hand this way. I don't think their deeper values and commitments have changed that much. You know, they, they are who they are. On the other hand, whatever the reasons, they're doing the right thing. So, and I don't want to give us any more credit than we do. We probably do bet more than zero, but, you know, it's a sign of the times. I mean, isn't it that um, the uh, the race card is 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 wearing thin, isn't it? I mean, uh, look at the pushback against critical race theory that we're seeing all around uh, the country. Um, the uh, uh, I, I, the 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 I don't know. I was about to say something I'm not sure that I believe, which is that maybe the the the. Um, Maybe the long, dark night of the uh, uh, obsessive uh, race mongering is is waning. You know, maybe that's getting tired. Maybe they can see that it's getting tired. The Democrats are getting a lot of uh, pressure from the right wing of the party about how to position themselves for the 2022 midterms or the worry that uh, defund the police is a is just a losing play that uh, some of the, you know, more radical members of the House of Representatives who've gotten elected from constituencies that are very, very left and very, very woke, you know, are, are pulling things down. And, you know, you got the 4th of July being uh, uh, treated with a lack of reverence by some prominent spokespeople. I, I saw a piece in Grio. This is not a prominent spokesperson. This is Touré. To Ray, the the uh, African American, don't think he would like you referring to him as right. not a prominent spokesperson. But oh, he's amongst African Americans, he's widely followed. He's got a piece in Griot uh, that he entitles "Fuck the Fourth of July," and he says Juneteenth is my holiday. You know, but I think smart Democrats, not just uh, the uh, James Carville types, I, I, I think people who are more to the center left of the party than James Carville understand that you can't win elections in America running around talking about fuck the 4th of July, talking about I don't give a damn about the flag, burning the flag at your barbecue. You can't succeed like that. You can't succeed by ignoring criminal violence that's spiking in cities around the country. You can't succeed by telling white people across the board that they're all racist. Y'all put your children on one side of the gymnasium and we'll put the children of color on the other side of the gym. They know that that's a losing Hand. I mean, the people in the universities don't know it, but the people who run political campaigns know it. So maybe this is the early indications of a, of a shift in the general tenor of the discussion that about race. I hope that that's true and that it manifests itself in what people think of as the proper politics, because one of the stupidest debates I've ever seen in my time watching these things is happening right now, where... Critical race theory refers to certain weird but interesting articles written, you know, 40 and 30 and 35 years ago that argue for a recasting of what we think of as justice on the basis of what it means to be non-white or non-various other things in this country. All of it is 
you know, it's kind of deconstruction meets legal theory and you know, nothing wrong with it. I'm fine. It's critical you're, you're race theory starts as the mm-hmm. writings of the Derek Bells of the world and the Kimberly Crenshaw yeah, of the world, you the know, Patricia all that, Williams, and where it used to be that you had only heard of it if you were people like us. Yeah, and now critical race theory, and you know, it's an acronym to CRT. I never thought that would happen. Now it is something that is in the schools, and it has to do with you know putting the white kids on one side of the room and the black kids on the other, and teaching certain lessons, and you know, teaching that white is wrong, teaching that black is to not be precise, teaching that whites are the oppressors, teaching black kids to start being wary of their victimhood early on. This is happening across the country in many classrooms to varying extents, but it's there. That's referred to as critical race theory too, because the people who promulgate this educational philosophy call themselves inheriting basic principles of critical race theory, which says, among other things, that for, for example, Black people, our narrative as victims of white oppression is what defines us and is more important than the details of individual stories, such as success stories and the like. So all of this balkanization of white from Black in particular It traces to those writings, even though Kimberly Crenshaw and Derek Bell were not thinking about what you do to six and seven year olds in the classroom. It was a different time. They were different people. They weren't they weren't classroom pedagogues. But still, critical race theory infected ideas are now being put into operation in whole schools. And I've been writing about this on Substack, turning upside down and being made these anti-racist academies where work by, for example, Robin DiAngelo and Ibram Kendi is put forth as basic texts. And a great many people find something wrong with what's happening in the schools, including some legislators who don't know a whole lot about legal theory, big surprise, don't know a whole lot about educational philosophy, big surprise. They're professional politicians. That's what they know about. And so there are these bills that are saying no teaching critical race theory in the schools. And this is where the the dumb stuff comes in. There's this whole strain of people who are saying you can't say that you don't want critical race theory in the schools because nobody's teaching Richard Delgado and Kimberly Crenshaw in fifth grade, which is just such a debate team nonsense tactic. Or more people are saying, because critical race theory is calling attention to the basic racist nature of our society, and you can say that that is there, the issue is its extent, but it's there, because critical race theory is teaching America to be honest about itself. If you don't want critical race theory to be taught in schools, what you're saying is you don't want anybody to be taught about racism. You don't want them to be taught about slavery. You don't want them to learn about Sojourner Truth. And no one has said that. Or if anything, from what I know, one of the state's bills clumsily written could be interpreted as saying that. But that's not what anybody means. It's clear. And yet, noble people are arguing all over the place that if you say you don't want these anti-racist academy philosophies in a classroom that your child is in, what you're saying is that you want American history to be taught the way it was in 1925, with a waving flag, slavery not mentioned, and everything is just fine and hunky-dory. That is utter smoking hot bullshit. And yet, there's this whole debate going on now where The left avoids acknowledging what's going on in these classrooms. They won't admit that all of these news reports spell something. Whereas, frankly, if there were two news reports of a black boy being shot by the cops, that would be considered an indictment of our whole national fabric and reflecting things going on in 50 states 24 hours a day. It is the most frustrating dialogue because no one knows what they're talking about. Go ahead. No, I was going to say they're intellectually dishonest. They're lying. You think so? I think so. And I think they know they're lying. I mean, I think they know, A, who are they? They are the left. They are the activist, anti-racist uh, pedagogues uh, in the schools, in the universities, in the journalism profession. who are trying to shape the way that people think about race in this country, including children in public schools. They know what they want. They want to teach that America was born in uh, uh, slavery and uh, genocide. Uh, they, they want to question the people who want to hold up the flag on the 4th of July and say they love their country and say the United States is a great uh, beacon of liberty uh, in the last uh, three centuries of, uh, of human political experience. 
They don't like that narrative. They hate that narrative. They hate the narrative that America is a good country. They don't like capitalism. They're deeply skeptical about the foundations of American civilization. They know what they're doing and they know what they want. And when called on it, they lie. Oh, it's a bugaboo. Oh, for example, like nine or 10,000 homicides with black victims a year can go completely undiscussed by some of these people. While uh, any incident involving a white police officer and a black criminal in which the criminal end up, ends up losing his life because of his behavior can become a cause celeb. Say their names, say their names. They know exactly what they're doing. So, you know, they don't play fair. You know, they, they're looking for a hook um, or a, a clever turn of phrase. They say, oh, defund the police. And then they say, oh, no, but nobody really wants to defund the police. We're not against police. Yes, you are. You know, um, so I think they know exactly. They say diversity and inclusion. They, they don't say lower the standards because people can't compete when you uh, draw the line the way that you're drawing it. So we're going to define the line differently. They're, they're going to say Asians are not non-white. They're going to talk about people of color and omit Asians whenever it's convenient to do so. So. Why would I, I trust them with something really important, like reporting on the political news, like reporting on what goes on in elections, like like uh, reporting on business news, like reporting on what's going on in the economy? Why would I trust these people? Sorry for the rant, but they know exactly what they're doing. That's my point. This is not a mistake. They're liars. I invite people to watch a debate I did last week to assess this. Um, it was with Gloria Ladson Billings, and it was about whether critical race theory should be taught in K through 12. Where will they find this, John? This is a monk debate. This is one of these M-U-N-K debates. So just oh, look yeah. them up. And we did this last week, and I was a little suspicious, I must admit, because I thought it's such a slippery topic in terms of what people think CRT is. But Gloria Ladson Billings is not an ideologue. However, she is very much ensconced on this other side that we're talking about. And I'm not sure where the debate went because, and I'll just say that she said that she is not into teaching people what to think as opposed to how to think. And if she didn't mean it, she's a damn good actor. She sounded sincere to me. And yet in the next breath, she was talking about how critical race theory it, you know, holds America's feet to the fire, teaches that we don't have as pretty a story as we're supposed to have. And to her, the idea that people across the country are being taught what rather than how to think was utterly alien. And yet she's a specialist in education, at least to an extent, she couldn't have missed the reports. She couldn't have missed what's talked about at the conferences that she goes to. And I think it's clear if you watch the debate that, yes, she does want American kids to be taught to be leftist radicals. Radical sounds like a slur, but I just mean in terms of what politics is. That's what she wants. But damned if you could get her to understand that when you talk about that trend, you're referring to her. I genuinely don't think she could see that that's where she is because she's been minted in several decades in which that way of thinking is seen as so normal that I'm not sure she can see. And I'm not putting her down. I'm in my own context where I can't see outside. She can't see that what she's thinking of as teaching people how to think is teaching them what. I'm loath to say that she's just lying. And that's partly because I don't like calling anybody a liar, but partly because I'm interested in the psychology of these things. I think I have to, it's the only analogy I have to use it. I think she's a fish who doesn't know she's wet. I think that that's what is going on. And as such, I see her as an innocent. I can't be angry at her. She is of an age, I'm not going to say what the age is, but all she's known is an educational establishment that wants to teach kids to be radicals. That's all she's ever known. I can't look at her and call her a liar. Now, with some of these people who are 29 or 35, 
maybe the story is different. But once again, they've only been minted in one thing. Because remember, they don't watch us and they don't read outside of, of what they find congenial. So I don't know, Glenn, if they're liars. All right. But maybe. I think that they, 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 they are of limited vision. That's the, 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 as far as I could go. Okay. Well, maybe I overstate. I don't know. Uh, in, in, my, uh, in my emotional excitement, maybe I overstate. Maybe I should be more generous and more forgiving. And, Liar. You know. Glenn, have you ever known anybody like that who was a liar? And this is a sincere question. Where they revealed after a while that they'd, be, they'd been dissimulating in view of a larger goal. I, I really want to know if there are people like that. I'm always on the lookout. I'd like to catch one. Okay. No, no one comes to mind offhand, uh, but I'll think about it. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder. Now, now, what is this CRT debate about like? What, what are other? Uh, I've been looking for analogies. For example, do you teach Darwin, the Scopes trial? You know, fighting about teaching evolution in the schools. So the people who were against the teaching of evolution were on the wrong side of that debate. I think we would all agree today, although in the 1920s or the 1930s, there were wide regions of the country, the Bible Belt, where it was a real argument. What about teaching creation science? Okay, the idea that, well, it's just a theory. Darwin's theory of evolution is just a theory. It is just a theory, just like Einstein's theory of general relativity is just a theory. All of science is built on just theories, and they're all sitting right to be overturned. So here's another theory, creation science. And I don't know enough about it to describe it, but I do know it's an effort to keep alive the biblical account of creation while at the same time acknowledging the importance of, of modern science. Should that be taught in the school? So you could have a real debate about that. I know one of my colleagues here at Brown, who's a, a professor in the biology department, I'll uh, think of his name momentarily, has devoted a lot of his time to crusading against people who want to teach creation science in the public schools. I'm sure there have been many, many arguments at school committee meetings and uh, citizens uh, weighing in and whatnot about how science is taught in the schools and whether or not evolution uh, is uh, properly being acknowledged as the modern understanding of the origins of the species. But that would be one area where there's a legitimate debate where, you know, I think we know what the right answer is, uh, but where uh, families and communities get the way in upon what's being taught to their kids. Um, sex education. That's another one that I think of. Should I be presenting anatomically correct dolls to six year olds? Should I be talking about transgender identity issues with nine-year-olds? Should I have condoms available to 13-year-olds? What do I teach about the family? How do I characterize the roles of fathers and mothers? What about homosexuality? What about same-sex parenting? How early, how vigorously, how is that going to be taught? Again, huge disputes. Uh, about that. Situate, I ask you, critical race theory within the context of those examples. Is there not something, this is a response to the people who say, ah, no, no, it's a tempest in a teapot. The Republicans just want a talking point. There's nothing to see here. Move along, move along. And there's plenty to see here. Uh, I'm, I'm inviting your reaction, but I'm already tipping my hand. We have a huge stake in a multiracial democracy in the question of how our young people are indoctrinated in terms of their civic understandings about the nature of their country, about their own uh, identity, and about how they relate to their fellow citizens. So uh, people who want to uh, ban critical race theory, well, no, I, I, I mean, we should talk about that. I'm generally skeptical about the wisdom of such legislation. On the other hand, parents who want to uh, swarm into a school committee meeting and say, what the hell are you teaching my children about their country and about their identity? I want to have a say in that. I, I think have every bit as much right as anybody who's concerned about teaching creation science or anybody who's concerned about uh, teaching uh, vagina and penis to a six-year-old. 
I think, yeah, I agree with everything you're saying. And I think it really ought to come down to what I wish people would discuss is simply, there are a couple of things that are being taught. One is that if you're white, you're an oppressor. If you're black, you're oppressed. Do you want your eight-year-old taught that? Especially when it involves separating students out into what are called affinity groups. What? A oh, hell no. Shifty. <laughs> oh, hell no. It's the only answer I have to that. Aff affinity. And then also, do you want your children taught that battling power differentials is the central endeavor of intellectual, moral, and artistic endeavor. Do you want that taught? So I think all of us would like a concern with power differentials to be one of maybe 10 things that an education is concerned about, maybe even six. But do you want that to be the central focus of all endeavor at the school? I think Almost all parents across the country would say they don't want that. And that is what is being referred to in shorthand as CRT. And for someone to look at this and to instead be like this squid throwing out black ink and to suddenly start talking about papers Kimberly Crenshaw wrote 40 years ago, to suddenly start talking about the nature of slavery and racism just by themselves, it obscures what is a real matter of educational concern. And I'm not sure to what extent these people are being deliberate about it, but it really is a tragic thing when you see the sorts of things that are being taught to students with parents complaining and smart people saying, oh, so that means you don't want them to know about slavery or, oh, well, that's not what Derek Bell said. So what are you talking about? This isn't a real conversation. This just isn't right. And yeah, I would like to see more clarity in this. But then you see, you know, Ross Douthat tries to do some clarity with a double article. And Professor Kendi has his piece in The Atlantic where he just claims that he's being misquoted. But all of it comes down to the same issue of not facing the classroom practice that parents across the country are tearing their hair out about, as you and I hear about daily, and which basically all you have to do is metaphorically open up the paper to see is a national phenomenon. Weird times we're in on that. What, is, what does Ross say uh, in his uh, two part uh, times? Uh, well, one thing he does is that he calls out the left for pretending that this isn't real. You know, the idea being that you say that there's something going on in the schools and the left throws up this smoke screen about racism and slavery instead of actually taking people at their word that they're concerned about something really alarming. And he actually does something he does not usually do. He, um, you know, very in his civil way, he calls out D'Angelo and Kendi by name, not calls out, but he, you know, he writes as if their views have been, have, have been designated to be extreme. That's all. And, you know, he's not allowed to do it. And I guess with Ross, unfortunately, because he's branded as evil by some people because he's conservative, he's not allowed. But then again, you can come from anywhere on the spectrum and be told that if you criticize, if, if you um, have anything but criticism to say about the idea of CRT being banned from classrooms, then you're in bed with no offense, but you're being Tucker Carlson. No, that's a vast oversimplification of what's happening. Yes, I know you were on it, but I think you also know his position on these things. So, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm very disappointed in our punditocracy on this. Um, and I tried to get across how I felt in a Substack piece where I got myself across exactly the way I wanted to as opposed to here, which is the oral format. But yeah, this CRT business is semantics gone haywire. Utterly well, haywire. I'm an economist and uh, modern economists generally speaking, are skeptical about Marxism as a intellectual framework for understanding economic growth, business cycle, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the the uh, actual arguments from Das Kapital have not aged well. You know, I mean, the uh, inevitable immiserization of the working class that wages must fall, fall, fall. Work is going to be worse and worse off. Uh, the, that that uh, capitalism was inherently uh, unstable and the business cycles were going to uh, uh, become more severe uh, and so on um, haven't haven't held up very well. Uh, 
someone who was teaching economics to high school students, you wouldn't teach it to K through eight, but you might teach it in the third year of fourth year high school class, uh, who declined, des- decided that they were going to teach Marxist economics, I think would be subject to a lot of uh, a lot of criticism from uh, the economics profession, as well as from parents and whatnot. But the idea that you would ban the teaching of Marxism. You can't teach it. In school. Terrifies me, frankly, that that's that's a tyrannical imposition on the freedom of uh, inquiry. Refute it. Don't ban it would be my would be my response. Point out to students Marx's influence was very important historically. If you want to give a, you know, account of the development of political thought in the West over the last 200 years. Marx is an important figure. Uh, Marxism as a doctrine, uh, I think, has been refuted by history. But that is my intellectual burden to demonstrate why it is that you should agree with me about that. And banning Marxism just makes it all the more alluring, all, all, all the more, you know, kind of thing that everybody now wants to get into because they won't let me read these books. We don't ban the books. We show why it is that they're wrong if we think they're wrong and we've got a good argument. And it seems to me that you can do the same thing with with CRT. I mean, people who say that we oughtn't to celebrate the 4th of July, like Touré said in uh, The Grio, fuck the 4th of July, Juneteenth is my Independence Day, should be argued with. I, I, I wouldn't ban someone from saying that. Some people are talking about putting cameras in classrooms the way they have body cams on the on cops making arrests. Let's put a, cl- a camera in the classroom so I can know what's being taught to my student. I mean, have they not read 1984? <laughs> yeah. I mean, really? You know, I um, <laughs> I agree with all of that. And I mean, it's kind of a moot point because not very many people are going to be teaching obscure legal articles to eighth and ninth graders. That's not usually going to happen anyway, but the basic perspective of CRT, and there's an overlap with Marxism there. Yeah, that should be taught to to young people as one view. And I wouldn't even say only to be refuted. And so, for example, I remember one of the first papers I read like that, I was in my thirties, but Regina Austin, who's basically celebrating the black lawbreaker, and, you know, this, you know, comes down today to arguments that the rioters are freedom fighters, etc. Now, you might not agree, but I would happily expose a smart ninth grader to an article like that and then, you know, say, discuss. And I can imagine a certain kind of ninth grader, especially these days, saying that they agree. Yeah, you, you, you have that as part of the curriculum. And me with my Montessori Quaker schools and then Simons Rock Early College for most people don't know about Simon's Rock, although they should, but, you know, substitute Bennington, that atmosphere. I had plenty of teachers who John, are- A lot of Mar- people don't know what Bennington is either, but that's okay. Little, little hippie <laughs> elite school, you know, that sort of thing. Okay. And a lot of my teachers were Marxists. I was taught sociology by a self-professed Marxist, said it in the beginning. I'm glad to have known such people, but the idea that that's what all critics of quote unquote CRT wish weren't happening is a cartoon. I'm not aware of anybody who thinks that no one should be exposed to a professor who admits hard left sentiments and assigns some pieces. It's the whole school being turned upside down into an anti-racist academy where people are taught only certain things. And it really is like something out of Orwell. That's the issue. And I genuinely don't know whether our detractors don't know that this is going on because it doesn't interest them. Maybe they would prefer to read about other things and they skip those articles. Or it's that they know that those things are going on, but they think that if we just keep it quiet and pretend not to pay attention, then pretty soon it'll be accepted as default and the world will be the way they want it to be. I'm inclined to think that it's the first thing, but maybe maybe I think there's too much good in people. I, I genuinely don't know. I want to reiterate something that you said earlier, because I think it was profound. People are always demanding, what's your definition of critical race theory? And you offered one. It was a two part definition. I want you to correct me if I get this wrong. (laughs) One part had to do with separating children by race and encouraging whites to think of themselves as privileged, presumptively in virtue of their race and as oppressors Mm -hmm. and encouraging blacks 
to think of themselves presumptively in virtue of their race as victims. Yeah, that's the that first was thing. one part. The other part of it was making this idea of countering disparities of power or influence into the central mission in life. You're here to get an education so that you can be a warrior on the battlefield of equity, on the battlefield of social justice. That, yeah. And, and you think the marriage of those two things basically defines critical race theory. It defines as practiced today in schools. Right. And yeah. as opposed by the people who are up in arms about it, that's what they're against. Mm-hmm. They're not they're not fighting a phantom. They're not just have, uh, as Ibram X. Kendi would have it, uh, a, an argument with themselves about something that's in their imaginations, but that doesn't resist exist in reality and that no one has ever said. There's a real thing that they are concerned about, and it has to do with uh, identitarian and and with the uh, a, a, a kind of co-opting of our kids into a crusade on behalf of political objectives, which are not universally shared. Yes, <laughs> and that was better put than I could. And I just reiterate it. That's all I just said. <laughs> you know, you, need, a, you but- need an editor, John. I don't. We all <laughs> and Indeed we do, except on Substack. But the thing <laughs> is, there are all these people who are pretending that what we're talking about isn't true. And it's just I think this one is new on me. A lot of those examples you brought up are useful. This I've never felt like there were there was more of this phantom aspect of the conversations that we're having. You say, oh, look at what happened in all these schools. Look at what you know, is nationally being prescribed as something that should be in all schools, CRT. Look at this. Do you like this? And then to have a bunch of people say, look at what? What are you, what are you talking about? You're talking to yourself. Read these papers from 40 years ago. Don't you notice that that's not in these papers? So what are you talking about? It's weird, but we shall get through this too. But yeah, it's an odd thing today, this, this discussion. <laughs> yeah. Well, John, I don't know. We've covered uh, a fair amount of territory here. Uh, what do you say? We call it a conversation. Um, and um, I think we are scheduled later this week to talk. Uh, we're going to do the Q&A. Yeah, we're going to do the Q&A, but also Jason Riley. Oh, Jason, that's Friday. Yes, yeah, that, that's Friday, which will go up in a couple of weeks. Sports fans out there, followers of the Glen Show. Uh, the next time John and I appear, It'll be in the company of Jason Riley, the writer at the Wall Street Journal and the fellow at the Manhattan Institute who has a biography out called Maverick, which is a biography of Thomas Sowell. We're going to be discussing that with him. That's right. But uh, all right, John, uh, enjoyed talking to you. You too, Glenn. Talk to you again in a few days. Indeed. Bye bye.